what what is the nice guy syndrome all right so the elevator presentation of nice guy syndrome a nice guy um we'll just focus on men here a nice guy is a guy who's inaccurately internalized an emotional belief that he's not okay just as he is usually occurs early in childhood and then it manifests throughout life so as a result he's usually doing two things one trying to become what he believes other people want him to be in order to get liked and loved and get his needs met and hide anything about him that he thinks other people might react negatively to. And for most of the men I work with, what they usually hide is their needs and their sexuality. And I'm sure we're going to talk about dating and relationship and trying to do a relationship with your needs, wants, and sexuality under wraps is really challenging. And, and that's why nice guys often struggle in these areas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've seen that we've seen that a lot um, within our coaching practice practices as a nice guy, um, thinking that he he wears it on his sleeve as though it's a badge of honor to be a nice guy. Yeah, I'm different than those other men. I'm different than those jerks yes. you women say you don't like. Yeah. And typically, I've noticed, and you mentioned this in your book too, is um, and I've noticed this a lot, is it comes from you know a lot of our belief system really does come from our childhood, but also too when we have a very influential father that probably wasn't the best father for us um, in regards to maybe some mental, um, emotional, or physical abuse. Or on the other hand, is a man that was just uh, raised with his uh, with his mother only, yeah. and the mother embedded him to be more of like the nice guy and treat women with respect, which is great. But you don't get that masculine structure because she's the mother. And so I see those two different things being very prominent when our coaching sessions with men. Yeah, and you, you've hit the nail on the head. Is that when I first started working on me and working with other nice guys, as I began to recognize this, a really common theme was a, a disconnect from their fathers. Either mm -hmm. dad wasn't there, uh, dad was alcoholic, dad was working all the time, parents were divorced. Nowadays, more and more, the story I hear from younger nice guys is that their dad was a nice guy. And, and, and basically, you know, don't upset your mother, you know, you know, do blah, 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 blah. So often, m most men who, who recognize themselves as nice guys often do report not having connected, trusting relationships with a good male figure at, at an early age. And then, of course, being overly um, thrust into a feminine world, you know, raised by their mothers, daycare, preschool, most, most boys I had one male teacher in all of elementary school. So, so it's not, so getting from second to third grade is not only learning your reading, writing, and arithmetic, but trying to figure out how to please a woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, the male brain is not very good at figuring out uh, the female brain. The things, we <laughs> think, the things we think will make you happy are usually so, so wrong, <laughs> so wrong, but we don't know what else to do. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Do you think that, um, this like in regards to our society today because i'm a big believer in this is actually not i won't blame it fully on society but do you feel like a part of our society i should say is emas teaching men to be emasculated in some way um and if so how well yeah beyond a shadow of a doubt well i I'll reference a couple things. One is that a lot of the men I work with, and you probably see this too, by the time they reach adolescence, early adulthood, basically they've just been told all their lives, well, don't be this way or don't be that way. Don't be like your father. Don't be like those other men. Don't be selfish. Don't be angry. Don't be. And so they get to be young adults and they don't know what to be, mm -hmm. right? What, what, what is left there other than I'm, I'm, I'm not being all those things. So therefore I should get valued and women should want to be with me, but then they're lonely and can't get a girlfriend or can't get laid. And so they wonder what, what that's about. And, but even another piece that really overlays it. I, I grew up with what I'll call the angry feminism of the sixties and seventies, where a few angry voices were saying, you know, every man's a rapist, you know, an erection's a sign of aggression. To, and, you know, I thought, I don't want to be that guy. Oh. I don't want to be, you know, I want to be him. Now that we've just changed the term to toxic masculine. Right. And so, and so like even when razor blade companies are doing commercials, integrating toxic masculine, it's such a meme in our culture to where almost anything that a woman doesn't like about a man 
anything a man does now is toxic masculine. So again, it's still kind of that same thing I was talking about. Men are going, okay, I can't be that. I can't be, because this is talk, toxic masculine. That's toxic masculine. That's toxic. What's left, right? What, what do I be if I can't be all these other things? So they go into the shell and that's where they hide that. They go into that shell because that's where I'm safe now because of everything yeah. else. Because yeah. And that's what I said I, before we even started recording on the podcast. That's why I said, I think it's so important that more people give really great structural advice and not mm -hmm. be very biased. Obviously me as a woman stepping into the man space, it wasn't easy. You know, I had, a, I had to really kind of prove myself and I know why, right? Because mm -hmm. here's the thing is what I'm noticing in the generation of just advice for men, not even dating relationships. It's just direct advice for men is we have a lot of men out there that are giving advice from not being healed from their own trauma. Number one. Yeah. yeah. Um, number two is we also are not teaching men the difference between aggression and assertiveness, like actually teaching them the right principles to really embody their masculinity because I can get, and now we have society with this Gillette commercial and showing, and I'm like, what is happening? You know, like what I, a woman needs a man, you know, like at the end of the day, like in order for a woman to be in her feminine, she needs a man to be in her masculine period. And so, and it can be vice versa, depending on the relationship, but also too, I, I do see that a lot of the nice guy mentalities are coming from the inauthenticity of I have to be this person in order to fit in this shell too. <laughs> yeah, and that goes back to what I said when you asked me what's a nice guy, that um, the nice guy believes I'm not okay just as I am. I don't even know who I am, but I, I know I got to hide these things because I might get a negative reaction, right? A woman might get upset. I, I might, you know, be a, a hashtag me too casualty. I might be told as, you know, toxic masculine. So they're hiding anything that might get a negative response. Oh, and I'll try to be this. But when I try to do that, it doesn't seem, I mean, so many guys tell me, I'm sure you hear it. You know, I try to do all the things I hear women say they want. And then, you know, but, you know, I ended up, I call it, they become a girlfriend of the penis. They end up yeah. in the friend zone. And you know, I get friend zoned by women. And they tell me, oh, some woman is going to be so lucky to have you someday, but they don't want to date me, right? And, and as you said, for to have any kind of polarity in a relationship, there has to be masculine and feminine poles. It doesn't matter who plays them, right. but they have to exist. And nowadays, most women are so strong. They're, they're in the masculine role so much. And, and I break it real simple. I define masculine as doing and penetrating. Feminine as being done to and penetrated. And we all have masculine and feminine sides. I've got a pretty strong feminine side. I've had to learn how to, how to activate more of my masculine side. So I'm, I'm attracted to strong women. But every strong woman I've ever been with did not want to be in charge of our relationship. They, they wanted to be able to trust me. My wife tells me all the time, she's, and she's a strong woman. She could kick my ass. <laughs> she says, I love it when you tell me no. I love it when you say we're going to do it this way. And I'm not, I don't want to be a controlling, you know, dominant in the negative way we usually talk about it. We can talk about it in a more positive way, dominance and submission. But I've had to learn to be more masculine in order to let the women in my life open up and melt into their feminine side and be taken and, and be blissed. And I actually learned that by learning how to salsa dance. Um, oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> funny. I refer so many clients to do that and they have great oh. results from that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How, how did you do, how do you do that? How do you learn to be, because that's the thing too, is that like, like Apollonia said as well, is that oftentimes too, when men are like, oh no, well, I, I can't be feminine, I have to be masculine. And then we have these people that are now going into the other side yeah. and trauma and, um, you know, Extra alpha. Extra alpha, which turns oh, ex into it's, 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 I haven't heard that term yet. Extra, extra, alpha. Just extra, extra. Alpha How do you, plus. Because, because we put this, we put this thing on them that says that you can't have any feminine now. Yeah. So it's like, how did, how did you do it? How do you find that balance? How do you access your masculine side? Uh, well, that's, that's a good question. That, that we can go for a while with that one. And let me just kind of add a little side over here. I've never been a real big fan of the terms alpha and beta. I, I'm not a big fan of the whole manosphere, red pill of, you know, oh, we're alpha, so therefore we're spinning plates and blah, blah, blah. I knew I liked it. I you. knew it. <laughs> and, 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 you know, oh, those, those beta blue pill men over there, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as you said, Apollonia, we men need all the help we can get, and we don't need other men, you know, putting uh, our brothers down. You're blue oh pill. Yo, you're beta. Yes. So, so I, 
I'm not, I'm not a real big fan of the alpha beta. I'm not an alpha personality, but I tend to get what I want in life. And so you don't have to be this dominant, blah, 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 blah. Um, so how did I learn to be more masculine? Um, yeah. I, I've actually got a, an online class called All the Way In that teaches men how to show up and get all the way into relationship and, and set the tone and lead. And I have a chapter in there that says everything I learned about relationship. I keep this in mind. I had a PhD in marriage and family therapy at age 29. Um, that didn't really teach me much about relationship or masculine and feminine energies. Those things weren't even talked about. But the, the, the lesson in this, in this online class is everything I learned about relationship, I learned from in dog obedience school and salsa class. And, and really what I learned was started learning that, um, for example, in the salsa class, when I you know, was learning, the first class I went to, I had to hold paper towels in my hands. I was sweating so profusely. I was so anxious. But the, 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 what I kept hearing over and over again from the teachers, and I remember my first teacher that I went to quite a bit was a, a woman, lesbian, excellent teacher, and she could do lead or follow either one, and um, just gave great advice. And, and she kept saying, you know, you know, Robert, you know, be more firm, be more clear. Let, let your partner know where you're taking her next. You know, your, 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 your leadership has to be just so unmistakable. Your partner knows where you're going. And the women kept saying, yeah, you're going to have to be firmer. You're Because I was trying to lead nicely. Right? <laughs> and now, now the, the alternative is not lead, you know, jerk as a jerk. It wasn't. It was, <laughs> to, yeah, it was learning to lead assertively. Right. right. And, and, and that taught me a lot. Now, the, the dog obedience school, I saw both of you kind of go, eh? what, what I found is dog obedience school is really owner obedience school. And, and that what they said is, is that we're all pack animals and hierarchy is important. Yeah. And, and, and a dog is going to seek to know where they fit in the hierarchy. We humans do that as well. And so what I found is that if, if as a man in my relationship, if I did not lead in any way, the woman in my relationship is going to look around at that vacuum and just step up and take charge. Um, and it may not be because she wants to, but she will, you know, she's strong. It needs to be done. And so the thing that I learned is that a woman can't follow where a man doesn't lead. Mm. That's true on the dance floor. It's, it's true in, in relationship. Now that leadership is not about do it my way. You know, it's not about that, that kind of controlling dominance. It's just showing up with a plan and having a sense of confidence about you that, that you know where you're going and you invite the woman to come along. It's same on the dance floor is that I'm not going to ask the woman, woman in between each move or each step. Do you want to have this done now? Would you like a cross body move? Should I do a pretzel with you? Should I? No, I'm just going to lead her. And if she likes the way I lead, she's going to relax into that and follow and be blissed by that. Um, if she doesn't like the way I lead, she can go find another partner to, to dance with. That's fine. That's, that, that works well. But if I don't lead, we're just going to stand there on the dance floor, you know, kind of looking at each other until one of us gets bored and walks away. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that leadership is, is so crucial. And when I found when guys are trying to figure out what to make, what to do to make a woman happy and please her, there's no real leadership. It's it, like I said, it'd be like me asking a woman every move, what do you want to do next? What do you want to <laughs> do next? Yeah. And, and you're laughing because I've, I've asked women in front of men I'm teaching, I'll say, do you like it? Well, what do you, I, how do you like when your man says, what do you want to do tonight? Oh. Do you want to go out? Where do you want to go for dinner? And the women go, I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. Make a decision, right? Yeah. If I don't like it, I'll tell you, but make a decision. And oh my so, God, the amount of times I've had that argument with, it, with <laughs> when I'm dating, like, I, I'm going to tell you, I don't like that. I'm going to change my mind. You're going to say, let's get Chinese food. And I'm going to say, yeah. no, I want Italian, but it doesn't matter. I just want you to make a decision. Just make a decision. <laughs> yeah. And that, that is so hard. Cause that goes back to the man saying, well, maybe I'll do something wrong. And one thing I've been preaching to men for quite some time in, in marriage therapy and otherwise is that a woman's reaction to anything that a man does does not determine the rightness or wrongness of the thing the man did. Right. right? The man says, let's go get Chinese. You said, I was thinking Italian. He didn't do anything wrong. It's just because you had a different uh, opinion on that. So th this is, you know, the, the work that I do with men is, is learning. I said, you know, 
Start living life on your terms. Live life the way you want to live it and invite a great woman to come tag along with you, to come join you in your great life. Don't try to figure out how do I fit into her life? How do I make her happy? How do I make her want to be my girlfriend? How do I make her want to take her clothes off? Don't worry about that stuff. You live your great life, lead, give her that chance to follow. Now, here's the thing with that. What if they're already in a relationship? And all of a sudden they're learning about this. How long does that take? Do all of a sudden they just come home and they're like, baby, hey, honey. <laughs> in his house. Like, big, big daddy 301 is yeah, here. Big, big daddy's here, here, right? here. Big papa's yeah. in the house. And she's like, yeah. I've been leading this whole time now. Yeah. So how, yes. does, how, do you, how do you get that, like, that leading back? <laughs> I, uh, that is such a good question. When I wrote No More Mr. Nice Guy, I, I wrote in there. I said, when I started working with nice guys, and, and because it does, it does shake up a relationship if they're in one. It, it shakes up everything. You know, if the guy starts setting boundaries or starts asking for what he wants or starts saying no or starts spending more time with his guy friends, you know, um, starts pursuing his, pra his passions, um, it's going to shake things up. And, um, and I, I say in the book that I, I, when I first started seeing this, I, I gave relationships about a 50, 50 chance that they would survive the, the, the guy doing nice guy recovery. And I, I write in the book that over time, I, I started giving it more of a 60, 40, that it wasn't going to work. And by the time I wrote the book, I'd say 70, 30, I'm about <laughs> at 80, 20 now. And, and, you know, we're, we're kind of laughing about it, but the truth is, yeah, if, if a couple have gotten together and fallen into a, a routine mm -hmm. that that at some level is comfortable and has served them even if it's painful and toxic um it could be challenging to to break that up so men will ask me a lot of times say well should i show my wife or my girlfriend your book and i go by all means buy them a copy you know let them have a copy and let them start underlining and writing in it and you tell them what it is that you're wanting to work on and what you're learning and how you want to be in this world and yeah. and you know do this as, as a team effort yeah. and in my experience, I'm going to say in general, women like my book. Um, you know, when, I, when yeah. the book got published, I think the publisher thought, oh, it's going to create this big controversial thing. It never did. Um, I maybe have gotten three angry emails from women in 20 years. So right. women like the book because it's teaching men to be honest and transparent and, and you know, good men, not, not just yeah. pleasing nice guys. So... I have found that a lot of women are really supportive of, of this work. Um, I, I got to visit a, a couple I'd worked with a number of years ago. I started working with the man over time, and then he met the woman. They got married. They're, they're in their, like, 50s. So um, they're both, like, second marriage for each of them. And they came down to Puerto Vallarta, where I live, and did some work with me a few years ago. And I actually got to visit them about three weeks ago. And, and the woman said to me, she says, Robert, finish that other book you're working on, uh, on around what I call positive emotional tension. Women tend to like the stuff that I teach. In couples therapy, you know, when I would start with the man, just like in dance class, you got to start with the lead. You got to show him how to lead or the follow's got nothing to lead. So I start with the man and I get the big two by four out, smack him upside the head and say, okay, here's, here's how women are wired. Here's what's important to them. Here's what most men get wrong. And here's what we're going to go to work on. And usually the women would kind of look at their husbands or boyfriend and go, this guy gets women. I like him. <laughs> and so, um, so what I found is women are pretty supportive of this dynamic. And many men have told me, hey, I, uh, my wife gave me your book. My ex-wife gave me your book. An ex-girlfriend gave me your book. So, so women uh, are, are spreading the word and, and they want men that they can trust, that they can depend on, who will set the tone and lead, um, who, who they can uh, open up and trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if they're not honest with themselves, then how can they be honest in a relationship? Yeah. If I can't depend on you to open up and tell me like what's going on, what you need, how can we be a team? Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, we're obviously, Apple and I are huge fans of the book. Yeah. And in another point you, you talk about in one of your chapters in um, the No More Mr. Nice Guy book is um, with women in general, right? Uh, I, I am a true believer that women look at sex differently than men look at sex and men look at sex differently. And intimacy is emotional for women, right? So we need our emotional needs to be met in order to want to have sex either with our partner um, or in our marriage, whatever the case may be. And sometimes those marriages can end up dying down 
Um, and um, then we look at, as sometimes what I've seen as well, is that the men is looking at this as, my wife isn't having sex with me, so I need to push for sex in order to feed the validation from within me, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so the woman is like, oh, I'm just not there mentally, emotionally, because of X, Y, Z, I'm going through a hard time in life. And so what happens is he pushes more, so then the relationship gets disconnected when they really weren't disconnected really in the first place. Yeah. But since the sex was pushed, it was more. And then I've seen that spectrum happen in a lot of you know people that we work with. And then the other spectrum is, I need to have sex with my wife in order to know that she's happy. So then he you have a guy that's cleaning the house, doing things for the kids and doing this and doing everything. I, I, I was that guy at one time. I was I look, I, I, I did the dishes. Look at all this. And my, 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 then, me know? <laughs> my then ex-wife would walk in. How come you haven't wiped the counters off? And I go, I haven't finished yet. Now we can have sex. <laughs> So yeah, I've been there. I've been there. Be rewarded through sex, and it's completely different. And you actually talk about this in your book. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's there's so many dynamics. The whole, you know, since we're kind of you know kind of leaning towards longer term relationship here, there's so many dynamics that, that go into this. Um, a great book by Esther Perel called Mating in Captivity mm -hmm. says that actually intimacy and hot sex don't play well together. Now, intimacy mean we know each other really well, we've gotten comfortable with each other, we've got a predictability to our life. The thing that most relationship experts point couples towards. We have great communication, we work things out, we're a great team, but, but she says that actually works against the polarity of having, you know, really great hot sex. And so, you know, it's almost, I don't think we have to choose one or the other. She's not saying that, but we do need to know that the, in those long-term relationships, kind of the more that just being together starts to feel routine, that starts to take a hit at the sex. Now, there's a lot of other things that they can go in to this change. Sometimes it's, it's the man is, is a lazy lover or a shitty lover. You know, he just thinks poking his partner, you know, is, is, is a way to do it. Sometimes he's using his own emotional neediness and approaching her to get sex, like doing the, 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 the kitchen thing and now have sex with me, have sex with me. And what I found is that women don't necessarily reject the desire of their partner to have sex, they reject the neediness that's behind it. Come validate me, make me feel okay by having sex with me. They, they push that away. That feels like, no, no, women don't want that, 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 that's, that hose hooked up to them where their partner's gonna, you know, fuck them and say, okay, I'm loved, I'm good, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, other pieces go into this as well. Part of it, you know, going back to a little bit of polarity we've touched on, is that most women in culture nowadays are in their masculine so much. They're doing all the time. You know, they're getting ready to go to work, they go to work, deal with customers, you know, coworkers, management, then they gotta get back home from work. Now there's dishes to be done, dinners to be made. If there's kids, most of parenting is masculine, is doing. The kids need to get their homework done, they need to have a bath, they need to have dinner, they need to get to bed. And then, you know, the man gets in bed that night, gives her a little shoulder rub, and she's going, oh, no, one more thing I've got to do. <laughs> and that's how it feels, right? It feels like, oh, I got to do one more thing, which is, again, masculine. And the deepest feminine desire is to be done, too. It, it's to be opened and, and blissed. And, mm -hmm. and but but if if the if the woman's been so much in her masculine all day, there's it, it, most women are not good at making that switch, right? So one of the things that I teach men, um, guys, you know, say guys new in a relationship or especially long term relationship, part of our masculine leadership is leading our partner back into her feminine, mm -hmm. back to that feminine state, and you know that might mean she comes home and first thing you say, sit down. You take, you sit down, you take her shoes off, your rubber feet, say five minutes, you're on the clock. Tell me about your day. You got my undivided attention. And she gets to, you know, decompress or feet are being rubbed. This isn't, there's no agenda here, right? This isn't to get her in the mood for later on. Right. It's to get her slowed down out of being in that masculine. I put a quote in No More Mr. Nice Guy by uh, Camille Paglia. Uh, lesbian feminist a lot of feminists don't like her because she actually likes men um, and, and I'm glad to hear you guys say you do too but she's I, the quote I use says that, that the typical woman out in the workplace is just going 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 and if she doesn't can't throttle that back when she comes home she's going to castrate everything in the home 
And not because the woman needs to, they're just, all right, this needs to be done. Let's get that done. Right. All right, you know, it's just like that. And so masculine leadership can, can be just, okay, you know, go to your room, change your clothes, go put on your sweats. Uh, you know, I've, I've set a glass of wine out or go take a bath, go, go read a book, go, you know, something to let her just get out of that fast. Got to do, got to go do, got to do. And then often, as you said, the emotional needs, I, I think women have a deep need to be heard, to be seen. I think if a woman knows she's heard and seen, now we guys think that might mean listening to them complain all night long. And uh, I, I give an example. I, I was dating a, a woman a few years ago. Uh, I met her at the mall. She sold me shoes is how I met her. And uh, so we started dating. And so early on, some of our dates, we'd go to a, like a Ruth Chris restaurant and go to happy hour and have a hamburger when she got off work in the mall. They were connected to each other. So she'd come over and she'd been working all day and, and selling shoes or apparel. And, and she, she just started complaining the customers, the management the this. And maybe if she'd talked to her mother that day, she'd be in a pit. She's always in a pissy mood after I learned after she talked <laughs> to her mother. So, you know, she'd come in and sit down and be complaining. I've already got the two glasses of wine in front of us. And I realized, you know, I, we're on a date. So I, I just, I took my phone out, like I said, put it out, set the timer for five minutes and said, we're on a date. I know you just got off work. You have my undivided attention for five minutes. Give it all to me. Mm -hmm. And like about, Two or three minutes in, she was done. It was enough. And then, and then, like she and I've had other women thank me for creating that container that they could just decompress, get it all out. I wasn't going to fix anything. They just had, you know, my undivided attention for X amount of time. And, and, and then she could relax and then we'd have a good evening. Yeah. So that's, you know, it's just an example of, of the masculine leadership. One of the things that I teach all men and I've taught all the women in my life, is I'm going to open the door for them. And, and a, woman, a woman taught me that about 15, 16, 17 years ago. She just said, hey, you know, I never know if you're going to open my door or not. Just, I don't care what you do. Either open it every time or don't. That way I'll know. So I said, all right, I'm going to open it. So car doors, office doors, store doors, whatever. I've taught all the women in my life, wait. I will open the door. I'll come open your, I'll put you in the car. I'll come let you out of the car. Now the woman doesn't need me to open her door, but it's, it, it, it creates a little bit of polarity. I'm the doing, she's yeah. getting done too. It's not a big deal, but I found that it's profound. And I found a teach guy says, do it, but do it consistently. Cause the first time you forget to come around and open her door, the first time you forget to open it again, she's going to either just sit there or stand there going, Hey, you taught me this. You know. <laughs> So, so they, you know, the feminine wants that consistency, but that little thing I've found personally is so powerful. My mother even waits for me to open her door. First time I did it, she said, if I waited, my dad's been dead for 11 years. She said, if I waited for your dad to open my door, I'd still be waiting. <laughs> All right. And I said, okay, but I'm opening your door. I, you know, my granddaughter is, uh, she'll be 14 next month. Um, she, she waits for me wow. to open her door. You know, she loves when, she loves when big poppy comes around. <laughs> So she loves when granddad comes around and opens the door for her. So yeah. now, now those, again, you know, women can open their own doors. Women can, you know, probably decompress in their own ways. But I found that's a gift we men can give to women with no attachment. It's not yeah. to get them, okay, you talked about your problems. We're going to have sex now, right? You know, it, it's not about that. And, and talking about the pushing for sex, you mentioned that. I teach men never, ever push a woman for sex. Not because I'm such a nice guy and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, doing, doing my, oh, look at me. I'm a good guy. Because um, women feel vulnerable. Women have been poked at their entire lives since, since yes. little girls. There's a reason hashtag me to exist. Women have been poked. And I have found if a man is in his masculine, setting the tone and leading, being himself, creating polarity, he doesn't have to push a woman for sex. I've found that, that women are often the sexual aggressor with me. Um, since I you know, got divorced 20 years ago and started living you know, this way with women, every woman I've been with has wanted more sex than me. I never push a woman for sex, ever. But because but, here's the thing I tell guys, whether they're, you know, it's the first time they're trying to get a woman to have sex or long-term relationship. If the woman for any reason has her foot on the brake for mm -hmm. any, 
Maybe, maybe you're on her first or second date and maybe she's in shaved down there or maybe she's on her period or maybe she's just not ready yet. She knows she's going to have sex with you. She's just not ready yet. Decision, yeah. so, so the foot's, you know, she knows it's going to happen, but not yet. And right. so her foot's on the brake. And I've told men, if you have your foot on the gas and she knows you're pushing for sex, yeah. again, doesn't matter if it's a, a, a second date or you've been married 20 years. If she knows you're pushing for sex and her foot's even just a little bit on the brake, guess what she's going to do now? Push harder on the brake. Yep. And I tell guys, you don't want a woman pushing harder on the sex brake. Mm -hmm. So pushing a woman for sex not only is is violating, but it doesn't serve you well, and the woman doesn't feel loved, and it doesn't make her say, "Yeah, penetrate me, do me, fuck me to God, I'm ready." Yeah. <laughs> no, they're they're like this. They're like this. So I know that's confusing to men because we want a formula. We, we want, the, okay, tell me the, the three steps. Formula, the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but I found that if, if the guy, again, is setting the tone and leading, creating the polarity, inviting the woman into that feminine space, um, she's the one that's already planning about when they're going to have sex. Yeah. Right? The guy's nodding your head, yeah. I love yep. that you validated that. You know, absolutely. I can agree with this more. I'm so happy I hear you saying this as well. Um, you know, Natalie built a product all around this master is called master of the bedroom. And she talks so much about this polarity and there's something that was out and we talk about this very openly. Um, it's called last minute resistance. And it was something that was pushed in the pickup community back when, and we've had a lot of guys get in trouble for this. And it's about pushing the woman to have sex if mm -hmm. she doesn't want to. And a lot of times, um, I, uh, what I've noticed too, and what you're saying is the energy behind it is, is, is relationship or not relationship first or second date. It's the woman will be able to intuitive, intuitively feel if you're pressing the brakes or if you're putting the gas on. Yeah, yeah. It's if not you're about pushing, having right. the formula exactly. So if you're pushing, excuse me. So it's not about having. Oh, I need to do this specific formula. It's about just embodying your like you, really knowing who you are as a man, and really standing up to that and positioning yourself in that way. Um, and I tell like men this all the time, and I remind them, you know you as a guy can probably walk outside of a neighborhood that's maybe not so good at 10 mm -hmm. o'clock at night but as a woman by yourself in a black shirt if you wanted to it doesn't matter but as a woman we can't do that without feeling like we're going to be in trouble i tell men all the time to really understand what what you're saying right now i tell men ask any woman you know does she feel safe walking in her own neighborhood at night alone exactly. and and no the majority of women are going to say huh -uh. Don't do it. And, you know, I'll, I'll even, you know, here in Puerto Vallarta where I live, if I see a woman walking at night on a dark street by herself, I'm thinking, woman, what were you thinking? And, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm not saying that in any way justifying like what the whole rape culture thing, but women have never felt safe walking the planet. And, I, and I've told men, if you understand that women by nature are security seeking creatures and trust is everything. I was actually doing an interview one time with a couple of women on a television show, uh, more middle-ageish. Uh, it actually was a radio show. So I went to the radio studio, was talking to them, and I made the comment on a commercial break that I said, I tell men, I said, if you fuck with a woman's trust, you're going to fuck with her lust. Yep. And the, the two women said, oh, oh, yeah, you need to say that when we come back from break. And I said, can I say that on the radio? And they go, well, so, so if you mess with a woman's trust, you're going to mess with a woman's lust. And, um, and it was funny. Probably about two or three years later, I, I walked into a coffee shop in the area that I lived, and, and one of those women who did the interview was sitting, talking to somebody else that I knew. Uh, was actually, she was a dating coach as well, relationship coach. And, and she waved, so Robert, you remember me? I said, yeah, yeah, I did a radio interview with you. And she said, I've got to tell you, when you said that thing about, you know, messing with a woman's trust, you mess with her lust. She goes, I'm, you know, I'm 50 something years old, been married for 30 years. And I went home, told my husband that. She said, as a woman, I'd never put that two and two together in my own head. That trust was so essential for me to open. Sex is vulnerable for a woman. You're getting poked and prod and penetrated in every way. And to enjoy that, you've got to let go. And to let go, you've got to trust. And I mean, women can bypass that. They can get drunk enough. They can create right. a fantasy. They can get into, you know, some old trauma related, you know, I'm mm -hmm. with the jerk kind of thing. Yep. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but to, to truly open up and experience the depth of bliss of, and when I say penetration, I don't just mean the guy jackhammer and the woman, you know, with his 24 seven heart on. It's about the man bringing all of his consciousness and presence and open heartedness and groundedness and passion and bringing all of that. Yeah. Natalie's over there. Yeah. Well, yeah. More, more, more. It's so important because what, that's the thing is like you were talking about before is the masculine energy is that penetrating energy, but as a woman, it's all interconnected with um, uh, how we're feeling and letting go of that guard. But also if, if a man is in that neediness energy, needing to validate, needing to do this, mm. and your intention isn't honest behind why you're even trying to penetrate us, yeah. we need to pick up all of your energy. You're literally going inside of us. So if I'm sitting there dating a guy and I sleep with him and he's got past trauma, he doesn't love himself, he's you know insecure, and he's just trying to get me to have sex with him to validate himself, now all of a sudden that energy is in me. <laughs> I gotta deal with that. I gotta pick up your energy now and like carry on about my day. So when, when you were talking about just that simple thing of like when a woman comes home and you're like, babe, there's a glass of wine for you, go change into something comfortable. You've got me for five minutes. It's that, and there's no intention behind. No oh, attachment, no attachment. That right there is sexy to a woman and why we would be the ones to initiate sex later because that is sexy to us. That right there is that we get to trust you. So let's break that down. Anything. Let's break that down even more for men. Cause so, so yes. here's that thing. So yeah, if, if, again, we'll go back to, let's, let's, let's talk about a guy on, let's say they got into a third date with a woman, you know, uh -huh. and he, He's like, you know, hoping he gets laid that night, you know, so he's, 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 he's doing all, all the stuff to push it. And, and, you know, as women, you, you, of course, know, you know why we take you out, right? We, we want to see you naked. That's the whole reason we take you out. And you know that, you know, you're not dumb. <laughs> I thought that you just admitted that. That's, that's awesome. Like, uh, well, you know, of course, we know. We uh, know. Of course you know, you know. That's why when we're ready, we wear that special lingerie. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, so, so, and, and then that, that's the point I really want to make, you know, when you're ready, it's going to happen. And I, and I tell guys, okay, listen, a woman knows within the first 30 seconds of meeting a guy, if there's a possibility, she's going to wear that sexy lingerie, right? Now, she doesn't know for sure if she's going to. She just knows if there's not a possibility. And, you know, then all the guys from there that use the nice guy seduction or the pickup stuff or trying to buy you enough drinks, hoping that'll, yeah, with some women, their insecurities and their alcohol issues, it does happen. But the the woman knows. So I tell the guy, so you really don't have to make this happen. As, as Chris Rock says, just don't say anything really stupid. Don't mess <laughs> it up, right? So the woman knows if it's going to happen, right? Or not. She, and now she doesn't know when, but, and, 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 you know, because of all the cultural slut shaming, women have to kind of like, well, I want to do it right now, but I'm going to give it you know, 15 more minutes before I, you know, put on the lingerie because, you know, you have to culturally blah, blah, blah. It's a bunch of noise, but it is what it is. Yeah. So, um, so I tell guys, think about it this way. If she already in her mind has entertained the idea, she's going to wear that lingerie with you. You don't have to push. All you have to do is show up, be you, mm -hmm. um, you know, bring that good vibe because you women are so yeah, sensitive to, to energy. Yeah, yeah. Be playful, be affectionate, uh, grab her hand and lead her, open, say, wait for me to open your door, um, invite her into your great life where she gets to see that this, this guy's got a fucking great life. Now, I'm not talking about a great apartment, a great car. I mean, those could be part of it, but that you've got friends, you've got a life, you're, you're a social animal, you, you take care of yourself. Let her see that part of your life you keep setting the tone and leading. And what I found when I was dating, again, I never pushed a woman for sex, push, never pushed them to get naked, but I am very affectionate and I will set the tone and I will be adventurous and I will call a woman up and say, I'm at your house in 30 minutes, be ready to go. I will do those kinds of things. And what I found is then the women put their foot on the gas and, and start, you know, either dropping the innuendo about sex or say, um, come over to dinner in my house Friday night, <laughs> you know, then, you know, she's going to have the lingerie ready. So I tell guys, don't push because you don't have to, you don't have to. Now that doesn't mean, no, I don't tell, I, I tell guys, but that doesn't mean be passive, you know, be you, 
yeah. you know, assert yourself, be bold. And when the door opens, by all means, walk through that door. Now, you may have to do something like, you know, the woman's, you know, been making little innuendo. And you may just have to do the bold thing. And my kind of thing was, all right, you know, take your clothes off and go get in my bed. Oh, I can't believe you're telling me what to do. You know, I never <laughs> let people tell me what to do. So I tell men, tell her to do what she already wants to do. Now, that, that again, that's not like, oh, you're going to read her mind. She, the, you guys, you, you gals send the signals when it's time, yeah. when you're ready. You're not that hard. Like, we <laughs> use our mouth. We talk. Yeah. We, yeah. we let you know those things. Your, your hand might end up on his crotch outside of his jeans. There's really? some signal for the guy to say. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, oh, it happens, it happens. And for the guy to say, oh, I've, I've had to say to women, this is as far as we can go in a public setting. Let's take it <laughs> somewhere awesome. else. That's awesome, oh. we can do that, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I definitely, oh man, this is so good. I'm like, my mind is like, yeah, like if Ben is like, and unicorns are all over the place and just so happy, but anyways. <laughs> unicorns exist, really? <laughs> yeah, we I've, I've been telling men they don't all these years. <laughs> Oh, uh, there's only two, then that, that's me and her. Um, okay, just right. kidding. Um, so with that said, um, one of the things too, I was, I was listening to you talk about, and I think this is so vital, and I think I should share a little bit in regards to my, as a woman too, you know, with my, in, in the relationship, like, well, in my marriage, excuse me, with my husband, one of the biggest things that he's, I'm a lot in my masculine, right? I mean, look what I do for my living, right? I work with men, I'm coaching, I'm doing podcasts, I'm doing videos, I'm like in the 60 percent of my day is spent in my masculine that's because i'm working and creating right so mm -hmm. the biggest part and that's when you hit it on the nail is there is times where he will just say how was your day let's stop let's chat close the computer he's just there and all it takes is like two minutes and he knows i have i know he has i have you know i have his undivided attention and then also too he lets me do my thing like if i need to die just just take away and just like be in my zone and watch my housewives he lets me be in the room alone he lets me he's like babe why don't you go take well, you back? he's he's happy for you to go do it alone <laughs> watching the housewives of wherever they happen to be yeah, while well, he watches his basketball yeah. exactly yeah. there you go yeah 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 please do please do go watch housewives <laughs> and he's like he always says just well, why don't you why don't you take your bubble bath do something you know and it's really it comes from a place where it's not like he's trying to fix the situation but then when sure. and this is where I think it's really important to talk about is the difference because women do want their man to try to fix a situation, not more oftentimes than not, if they're in a state of harm, if they're in a state of confusion, if they're in that notion, let's just say. Mm -hmm. And one great way that he does it is he understands me, right? Sure. My reactions, sure. my personality. And that's what's really in, in powerful in just regards to dating and relationships is just understanding the person that you're with. And when we start to understand that comes from pacing, right? Taking your time to get to know someone, not rushing into a relationship, looking at their qualities, having the great discussions, talking about more than just, unless you just want the one night stands, that's okay too. Talking about more than, you know, the beyond the superficial level, what we may call it, whether aspirations, goals, and things like that. And then secondly, when it comes to that, I noticed too is the decision-making, right? I am just last week, on his birthday, it was his actual birthday. He was like, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, and he asked me the question, what do you want to do? And I he only asked me because it was his birthday. Because and, it was his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to figure that dynamic out for a minute. But. <laughs> and, and I looked at him and he's like, well, this is what I want to do. I will either want to do this or this. So you choose if you want to do any of them because I know you're tired. And I was like, well, no, I don't know. I just, I don't know really. And he's like, well, then I'm going to make a decision. This is what we're going to do. Let's go. And right then and there, it was like, this is, that's what he does constantly. I need someone when I don't know, if I know, I will make the decision. But yeah. if I'm like, uh, I'm not too sure, especially in long-term relationships, then this is when I'm like, oh yes. And after he did that, the first thing I said was, thank you for making that decision. Yeah. You know, and, and this is, we'll go back to dance. This is a dance, right? This isn't about your husband making every decision, uh, you know, I guess the word would be unilaterally like, okay, we're doing this. Now there, there's, there's a place for that at times where like the dance, he's just going to lead you because that's how he wants to lead you. But a good dancer so does, uh, will, on the dance floor will observe what their dance partner 
what seems to light them up a little bit, what, where they seem to struggle with a certain thing. And, and a good dance leader will see what lights their partner up and do that occasionally, but not a lot. Because mm-hmm. if you did it a lot, all of a sudden, it's not going to light her up, right? You got you to gotta surprise her with it. Now, if, for example, you're dancing with your partner, and you realize she doesn't handle a certain move very well. Well, that means you probably better get a little better frame yourself, a little more clarity, and maybe even whisper in her ear. Let's try this one again. Let's see if we can, you know, to let her know the two of you are going to work together to, right. to, to help that move go better. Um, and then maybe, you know, kind of take a break from it. And say, all right, let's try that one again. And all right, we, we're, we're, you know, and you're getting it now. And now, now at some point that move might light her up. But it, the dance is not like, I've got these 25 moves I'm going to do in order because that's what I rehearsed in front of my mirror at home. And I'm going to leave the, the, whether you like them or not, or whether you can do it or not. And because that's what I've rehearsed. No, there, there is so much more ebb and flow and pain. And there's the paying attention. You know, that's really what, what, what you're saying is there's the time that's taken to pay attention and truly know somebody else. Mm-hmm. And I think couples, when they have genuine intimacy, they, they, they know how that dance works. I'll, I'll, I'll give you just an example. Uh, um, my wife and I were um, uh, visiting uh, my mother's house up in Washington State. We live in Porta, Porta Vallarta. My wife's Mexican. And uh, she got two kids, and my stepkids. Her son's 15. Her daughter is about to be 14. Uh, so her 15-year-old son is a um, good-looking kid. His name is Angel. Um, uh, in, 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 in English, it'd be Angel Flowers. His last name is Flowers, Flores. So I'm thinking, you know, he's, he's, he, you know what, what, what a, he'd be perfect for a boy band, right? Good-looking <laughs> kid. So anyway, he's got, he's got a girlfriend. And, and to make this even more interesting, his name is Angel. Her name is Angela. It's Angela. Wow. Uh, I haven't met her. Uh, but anyway, so he's been to the mall a couple times with her. And so he sent, um, she told my stepson to send his mom a picture of, of them or of her uh, while we were away uh, visiting for last, a couple weeks ago. And, and my wife showed me the picture and, and said, she's ugly and made some, you know, kind of a derogatory remark about her physical appearance. I'm just looking at her going, she's just a 15 year old girl, you know, that's about, but I knew there was energy there Mm -hmm. uh, about my wife, but I didn't say anything. So that this isn't the moment to say anything about the energy. And then a couple of days later, we were driving somewhere still up in the Seattle area. And my wife made the comment while we're driving. She said, I know that wasn't a very nice thing I said about Angel's girlfriend. And I said, no, no, it wasn't. And um, she said, I'll probably kind of feel that way about every girlfriend he ever has. And I said, probably, you know, you're, you're a mom. You know, he's, he's, he was your firstborn. He was your little boy. Uh, and she goes, and I said, you, you just probably need to be careful that that energy doesn't leak out around him or around the girl. She goes, I know. I said, I, I know that wouldn't be good. So like, I didn't, I didn't have to say a thing. You know, the part of me that wanted to say, you know, that's really inappropriate, blah, blah, blah. But she came to it on her own, and then we could have a discussion about it because I knew her well enough that I wasn't a good time to talk about it, but we would. And I didn't even have to bring it up. She brought it up, and I think she kind of felt probably my kind of like this when she, you know, made. And so that's the dance, right? And that's, as you, as you say, uh, as you get to know somebody you can have that dance and then you feel known and then there is trust. And then there, you do feel like opening up and being taken and being penetrated. But if you don't, for most women, if that's not there, you know, they, they may let a guy do them, but it ain't the same as being done and being done well. Yep. Uh, it's a big difference. Big difference. Awesome. Yeah. That's, this is amazing, Dr. Glover. I really, really, I really appreciate it. And I know we've got to wrap it up here. Um, we definitely would love to have you back on. I'm sure everybody is going to Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes. Um, I do want to touch on something. One last question before we actually exit our way out in, and tell the guys everything about you, where they can find you is, what advice would you give um, for a guy, uh, for a young man, or just a man, man that was maybe married his whole life and then getting back into the dating scene? Um, yeah, and been there. <laughs> um, and recovering from the nice guy syndrome. And I just want to actually clarify, like nice guy is a good thing. A nice man. Being, 
people it, tell me all the time, you know, I tell them the name of Robert, but you seem like a nice guy. And they said, I hope I'm a decent human being, right? I hope that I'm a caring, compassionate, open-hearted individual. That's different than having an, an agenda or a covert contract that I'm going to yeah. do this for you so that you'll like me and, and think exactly. I'm good. Exactly. That's where it comes from. And I'm glad we mentioned that. That's what I wanted to mention because I think that's really good to mention. So with that said, for a guy that's just getting out there or a guy that probably doesn't know and he is that nice guy where he does have that syndrome to do for others to please him his voice is hidden or maybe he got divorced and this his ex-wife wiped him for everything he had because he didn't speak up or whatever and now he's yeah. like i'm naked and i'm afraid <laughs> exactly what 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 advice would you have for those type of men um that are getting back out put, there? Some, put some clothes on no, um... <laughs> It's funny you say that because I, 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 I've been saying, and I say in my book, Dating Essentials for Men, dating is basically, this is true for men and women both, but especially if a man decides, I want to go date, right? Uh, I want to go meet women. Dating is basically standing naked in front of every woman in the world and saying, in spite of all my visible flaws and all the ones you can't see yet, do you find me interesting enough to talk to me, give me a phone number, go on a date with me? That's scary stuff. That's vulnerable stuff. It's, 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 it's feeling exposed to the world. And that, that scares all of us. It scares men and women both. That, so that's okay. It's okay to be scared. So the advice I would give, this is what I took. When, when I got divorced in my late 40s, um, hadn't dated since high school and college. What I did back then was not dating. Uh, it was finding one woman and, you know, who I'd listen to her talk about all her problems and then I'd stay with her forever. Um, so I decided I had to become a better picker. And I had to become a better ender. So I realized I had to learn how to date. I had to learn dating skills. Now, at that time, kind of the, the pickup community was just beginning to blossom. So a lot of my clients were giving me books. You know, I, I, I read the game. Uh, I listened to podcasts, you know, listened to David D'Angelo's Double Year Dating. But, you know, and there's some good information out there. Now, I've never, I'm, I don't teach pickup. I, I call my book the Unpickup Guide to Dating and Success. It's more about being authentic, just attracting people who authentically are drawn to you as you are. Uh, then you don't have to make anything happen. So I tell, I tell guys, get out there, work on getting comfortable in your own skin, learn to live life on your terms, do, do it your way. Become a social animal. That was crucial for me. I just, I just kept putting myself in public and just practice talking to people, not hitting on the prettiest woman in the room, just talking to people, young, old men, women, fat, skinny, little kids, everybody. I just practiced yeah. talking to develop the social skills to where I got comfortable. Um, and then take that dating advice. There's plenty of it out there. And I tell guys, treat dating like a scientific experiment. Don't treat dating like, how do I get a girlfriend? Or how do I not feel like a loser? Or how do I get laid? Or how do I find, you know, another wife? No, treat it like a scientific experiment. Go out and just try stuff to see how it works. That's what I did. I didn't know how to ask a woman for her number. So I just tried stuff, you know? You know, I, I do different things to, to just practice getting women's numbers. And I found out, oh, this is really easy. A lot of times you just have to ask. <laughs> You just, have to take your, you just have to take your phone out and say, give me your number. I'm going to call you later. We'll go get coffee, you know, with your phone out. And they go, oh, yeah, sure. And then they spell their name for you, you know. I thought, oh, wow, is that simple? All this time, I didn't know. It was, I just had to ask. So go out and treat it like an experiment. And I, I've been telling men for a long time because I've been a relationship therapist for years, uh, dating coach for, you know, 12, 13, 14 years. I say that conscious relationships, whether it's conscious dating or conscious long-term relationships are the most powerful personal growth machine I know. Mm -hmm. Treat it that way. Approach dating not like, oh, I got to get somebody to like me or I'm, I'm, I feel like such a loser because I haven't had sex in three years or never. I got to get laid. No, treat it like I'm going to just go out and have an adventure. I'm, I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. I'm going to grow I'm, I'm, and, and treat it that way and you'll have a lot of stories to tell and a lot of adventures. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where all my stories come from. It's just getting out and having an adventure, not trying to make anything happen. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. Love that. Yes. Dr. Glover, thank you so much. I feel like I have so much energy and I can conquer the world now. After Boom. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope the men that are listening 
and women, hope maybe, yeah, um, do cool. feel the same way. Thank you. Love thank thank you. For, thank you for the invitation. It's been fun. Yeah, guys, if you want to know more about Dr. Robert Glover, or if you have, I'm sure some of you have already downloaded his book that we speak highly about on all of our YouTube videos and our coaching sessions. You can find it anywhere on Amazon. You can just Google no more Mr. Nice Guy and you can find the book and purchase yep. one. It is no joke. Also, there's another book called Dating Essentials for Men that Dr. Robert Glover actually written as well. You can find more about him at Dr. Dr. Glover, G -L -O -V -E -R com. I'll also put it below in the description box as well. If you guys want to go ahead and check him out. Thank you, Dr. Glover. Again, we're going to definitely have you on. Thank you. Time. I'll be back. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, guys. And as always, remember you are always loved.